We uh, have with us a, a very distinguished panel. The way this will happen is that Desmond Blockland, resident fellow of the American Enterprise Institute and former managing director of Solomon Smith Barney is going to launch off with a, with a PowerPoint uh, presentation. Simon Richmond has already referred in advance to it uh, at, at Desmond, which is great. And we're going to be followed by Joel Smotkin, senior fellow of the New American Foundation, author of The City, A Global History and the New Geography, also an author of one of our reports that we're distributing, which is available on the New America Foundation website at www.newamerica.net. Uh, Bernard Schwartz, Chairman and CEO of BLS Investments and Chairman of the Board of Third Way, uh, also co-author with Cheryl Schwenninger, who will also be up here of Public Investment Works in the latest issue of Democracy, a Journal of Ideas, and Janet Kavanoki, uh, Director of the Transportation Infrastructure uh, Project in, in, in the uh, Congressional Public Affairs Division at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, originally Tom Donahue, President of the Chamber of Commerce, has been writing quite a bit uh, lately about public infrastructure issues as well. And finally, as I mentioned, Cheryl Schwenninger, uh, who heads our Economic Growth Program at the New American Nation. They will be joining us after Des Lockman's, uh, uh, Desmond Lockman's uh, talk here. And uh, so without further ado, please welcome Desmond Lockman. Thank you very much, Steve, for the introduction, and thank you very much for inviting me to share my views on uh, the current situation. Uh, at this stage, uh, what I want to be doing is trying to give a diagnosis of the situation and indicate what sort of negative policies might be needed uh, to address it. Uh, I'm not known for not being a clear and straightforward with my views, so let me start right at the outset to you know, distinguish myself uh, from the panel that went before. Uh, and I'd say that this has to be one of the most serious situations from a macroeconomic point of view that I've seen in my career, and it's pretty much not a United States problem alone, but it's rather a global uh, problem. Uh, and I was very glad to see uh, that one doesn't really have to have a PhD in economics uh, to realize that this isn't just a housing problem, uh, but we're talking about a major credit bubble that is in the process of being unwound. I think it's very important that we diagnose the problem correctly uh, so that we get the right kind of policy prescription. And I'm afraid that just observing the Federal Reserve in the last couple of years uh, has to lead to a great degree of disappointment. Uh, first, they didn't realize that they were contributing to an enormous bubble. They did nothing to stop that bubble. When that bubble burst, they've been very slow in reacting. In fact, it took Ben Bernanke uh, till something like August this year uh, to realize that not only was there bursting a bubble, uh, but there was a credit crunch of major proportion. Uh, let me indicate, uh, let me indicate uh, more clearly uh, why it is that I have a great concern about the current situation is that I think that we have a situation here in the United States where the economy is being hit simultaneously by three major shocks. Uh, the first is a housing price bubble deflation, uh, the likes of which we haven't seen in the post-war period. We really have to go back to one of the speakers mentioned to the 1930s to see house prices uh, declining at a national uh, basis. Uh, the second is that we've got a major credit crunch that is worse, very much worse than what we had in the long-term credit management, the capital management crisis of uh, 1998. Uh, the third is that we've got oil prices at very elevated levels. If those three shocks aren't enough, we've now got a stock market that is beginning to falter, that wealth is being destroyed uh, in the stock market, and we look as if we're on the cusp of a dollar crisis. What we've been seeing since August is that the dollar has been decelerating at a, uh, a depreciating at an accelerating rate. People losing confidence in the dollar, both because of the state of the economic, the US economy, what they anticipate, and because of the mess uh, in the United States uh, financial uh, system. Uh, I'd like to just elaborate uh, on uh, couple of these points 
by referring to a chart. The one chart that I really do want to emphasize is uh, the next chart. And this is the Schiller chart of house prices in the United States over the past uh, 100 years. I'm going to forget about um, before the Second World War, but if you take a look at this chart, uh, what you see is truly spectacular is that in the post-war period when we had a typical housing boom and bust, the worst that would happen is that house prices would increase by 20%, and these are adjusted for inflation, so these are real house prices, we'd get a bubble of 20%, uh, and then we'd get the bust, and many of those busts led to recessions. Uh, this, we're talking about an 80% increase in house prices, practically a doubling of house prices in real terms, at the national level. So this isn't uh, something that is minor. You've really got to expect a major uh, reaction, uh, correction. If you look at the next chart, uh, this is the second chart that I would suggest is really important, in that this looks at United States house prices in relation to income. For about, about a 20, 30 year period, the line is practically flat. House prices were roughly 3.2 times income in the United States. If we look at where we got to now, we're looking at something like four and a half times. So it doesn't surprise me at all that Goldman Sachs, uh, for instance, is now talking about house prices over the course of this downturn, which will take several years, will correct by 15 to 30%. Uh, people might dismiss this as saying that uh, housing only constitutes 5% of the US economy, what they deal is. Uh, but the real big deal is that we're destroying wealth uh, to the tune. If this does occur, there's something like $21 trillion worth of housing stock. If you take 20% of that, we talk about $4 trillion uh, destruction of wealth, which certainly is going to have any bearing on uh, consumption expenditure. And I'm going to come to the point shortly, uh, this is going to really complicate uh, the credit crunch that is already going on. Uh, if we just go to the next slide, just show that house prices already are falling. Case is showing that that's falling at the something like six percent. Uh, and a different way that one can look at it is just ask oneself, uh, what is the state of the housing market in the United States right now? It's characterised by excess supply. Whatever you look at, you know, whether it's inventories, unsold houses, whether it's vacancy rates, we're at, in uncharted territory. We're really at record levels on those. Uh, uh, indicators of excess capacity, but then if we ask ourselves what is going to happen to demand and supply going forward, well, most of the subprime lending and Alt-A lending that was something like 40% of financial houses, well, that's not going to take place. If we don't have the financing occurring, we've got lending standards in the banks being tightened abruptly. And then if we go to the next slide, uh, we've got, this is the mortgage resets uh, that are occurring, adjustable rate mortgages. That's the first month is the first month of this year. Uh, so we're moving into the period where those are going to peak. Over the next uh, 18 months, you've got $800 million of mortgage resets. Uh, these were done at teaser rates which people could barely afford. So as they reset, we really are going to be getting uh, increased to false uh, estimates are something like there'll be two million foreclosures next year, and this is the reason why we're reading about some attempt by Treasury to get a workout uh, to prevent all of uh, that um, uh, damage. Uh, a problem with the recess, if we go to the next slide, is that this slide just shows that there was a deterioration of lending standards, and this is the rate of delinquencies on loan of a particular vintage. What you see in the line on the far left is that is 2006. Loans, subprime loans made in 2006 are, are in delinquency practically as the loan is written. So what we're going to be seeing now is the adjustable rate mortgages as they reset in 2008. Those will be on the 2006 vintage, so the losses are going to be very high. That brings me to the issue of uh, the credit crunch. Uh, if, uh, slide, please. The credit crunch, uh, you know, we can talk about it loosely, but I think we've got to get some quantification of how important is the credit crunch. 
debate for that. He, at the beginning of the year, when he told us that there was a subprime issue, uh, it wasn't a big deal. Uh, a little bit later, he said, well, maybe it's a problem of $50 billion to $100 billion. Uh, his latest estimate, uh, testimony uh, about a week or two ago, he says, well, a figure of something like $150 billion uh, is in the ballpark. Meanwhile, on Wall Street, we've got people like Joseph Ackerman, head of Deutsche Bank, who doesn't have any interest in exaggerating what the problem is. He's talking about $250 billion. The analysts on the street at Deutsche talking about $400 billion on the subprime problem. An important point was made this morning. $200 or $400 billion isn't very large sum in relation to the United States economy. The problem is, is that we don't know where those losses are, which is causing banks to be very scared about lending to one another. They don't know who is really saddled with the big loss. And this is the reason that you see the financial markets uh, freezing up uh, right now. Uh, a point that uh, I think is important to stress is not only is this not only a subprime problem, it's not, it's definitely not only a subprime problem, uh, there's a housing bust that has got big consequences, but there's been a credit bubble, lending standards overall were loosened in a remarkable way. So what we've got waiting to occur is the same sort of problem that we're seeing in uh, the subprime mortgages, we're going to be seeing subprime credit cards, subprime auto loans, home equity loans. There were a lot of junk bonds that something like just a mere trillion junk bonds were lent at rates that clearly implied a very much lower uh, probability of default than the historic probability of default. So we know that there are going to be losses all around. Uh, estimates by Goldman Sachs that came out uh, last week suggest that putting aside the 200 to 400 billion dollars on the subprime case, we might have the same sort of numbers in other lending. So it's little wonder that the financial system is clogged up. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, this slide uh, just shows what's happening in asset-backed commercial paper. Uh, this is really a run on the bank's bulk balance sheet uh, uh, activities. Uh, meaning that the banks are going to have to bring stuff back onto their balance sheets, which means that they're not going to be too excited about making uh, new loans. And once again, I think that this is a incredible oversight by the Federal Reserve to allow uh, off balance sheet activity to be occurring at the rate that it did. You know, that for instance, the structured investment vehicles, we've got something like $400 billion, uh, which is a real uh, problem. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, this just slide is just showing you one of the measures of the credit crunch. And it's just looking at the green line is the LTCM, that was the 1998 credit crunch. And these are just in terms of days. Uh, and you see the green line, situation stabilized rather quickly. Uh, what the blue line is showing is the current credit crunch. We had a peak in August, that's when things were really uh, uh, very intense. Everybody said, oh, well, it's going to blow over. This is just a liquidity problem. You know, the Fed pumps in enough uh, money, opens the discount window. Everything's going to go back. Well, this chart isn't updated as it should be, but we're back to the peaks of August. You know, that's the reason uh, that Nancy and Cohen are now talking about uh, or intimating uh, that uh, December the 11th will be when they're going to be cutting interest rates again. Uh, and uh, hopefully they can last till uh, December the 11th. Uh, uh, next slide. Uh, this slide just dramatically shows the tightening of lending standards. Uh, you know, we're already back, but this is a Federal Reserve uh, questionnaire. They ask officers at uh, institutions you know, how they feel about lending. And you see that they're not too keen about making mortgage loans in general. And if we go to the next slide, uh, this just shows that the problem is a global problem you know, because we parked a lot of the toxic paper globally. So the same problem that we've got in uh, the United States uh, they've got uh, in Europe elsewhere, so we're getting a tightening of uh, lending standards. Uh, I think that's very important, uh, as I might have mentioned at the start, uh, that we learned the lessons from the Japanese. 
uh, as to how to deal with a situation like that. And I would venture to say that what one really needs is one needs very aggressive policies on monetary policy easing. And secondly, one really needs to facilitate the process of repricing of uh, risk that it doesn't serve the long-running interests of the country to have banks not recognize their losses, not be more transparent in their transactions, because that will just mean that we'll have very little lending as Japan had for a lost decade you know, during, uh, the 19, uh, during the 1990s. Uh, I want now just to talk a little bit about uh, monetary uh, policy. Uh, you know, I've mentioned that what we really need to do is uh, uh, have a very much more aggressive uh, easing of policy, uh, <coughs> do something about a bit of transparency. Uh, next slide. Uh, I just want to talk though about monetary policy not being that straightforward uh, because we've got real constraints on monetary policy right now. And I'd list them in two groups. The one group deals with the inflationary threat. Uh, that currently, what we've got is we've got oil prices at, uh, they've dropped a little bit below $90 a barrel, but we're pretty at very high oil prices and food prices, which is feeding inflation. Uh, the other, uh, that's the oil price chart, you know, that you can see that oil price is pretty high. And you can go to the next chart, please. Uh, this is really the dollar. Uh, dollars spent over the last uh, five years. Uh, what is scary about this chart isn't that we've been in a downward trend on the dollar. That is healthy. That is part of the adjustment process. But it's rather what occurs after August is that the dollar looks like it's a little bit in the free fall uh, and doesn't really surprise me if uh, foreigners are anticipating that the U.S. economy has got problems. Fed's going to be reducing interest rates and the financial system the assets that you bought weren't what you thought they were. You stuck with three and a half trillion dollars of assets. Uh, maybe it's not a good idea to add to that, and that gives rise to the problem of next slide uh, of financing a current account deficit, which is improving, uh, but it's a mere eight hundred billion dollars a day. Uh, 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 sorry, eight hundred billion dollars. I don't want to exaggerate. Eight hundred billion dollars a year. Uh, roughly, we just need foreigners to finance us on a net basis by uh, two billion dollars a day, and they might have reservations about doing this after making losses on uh, their uh, loans. Uh, I just want to address the inflation issue uh, because I think that when I look at the shocks that the U.S. economy is subjected to, the tidal wave that waits ahead of us is it seems to me that it's going to be very difficult for the United States to avoid a recession going forward. In a recession, what one would expect is one would expect the commodity prices to come off. You know, if you had a global recession, uh, but more importantly, that the slack that would be generated in the economy uh, would be giving rise to wage pressures diminishing, price pressures, pricing power diminishing, and I think that that would swamp the effect from the uh, from higher oil prices or from a weaker dollar. I don't think that the Fed has got any alternative but to move uh, very aggressively on interest rates. Uh, what I would say, though, is there's a need for coordination, global coordination of policies here, uh, because we're in a rather absurd situation in which the dollar is declining. The Fed is talking about reducing interest rates to address its problem, and the Europeans, in their infinite wisdom, are talking about raising interest rates. So no wonder that the euro is moving at a very high rate. The problem is the Fed is looking too much in the rearview mirror. I think that that's the only thing that uh, the Europeans look at, that they really don't see that they've been subjected to very much of the same kind of shocks that we've got uh, in uh, the United States. Let me just uh, finish uh, by saying uh, that there are longer run problems that financial policy uh, needs to address. Uh, if these, I think that financial policy has got plenty to deal with uh, in the short run. You know, what is very important is to prevent this. If there's anything that we can learn from the Japanese, that if this is not addressed in a recession, 
threat that conditions are going to get worsened, that you're going to have larger losses within the system, you can really spiral into something that is very nasty. And I think that the Fed is finally waking up, smelling the coffee, seeing this, providing a lot of liquidity through the discount window, now beginning to cut interest rates aggressively. I think that they've really got to do that. Longer run, what we really have to do is ask ourselves, how do we get into this mess? And I think that uh, the answer to that uh, is rather complex, uh, but there are issues that there was not proper regulatory oversight. Non-bank uh, originators originated something like half of the mortgages. I'm not sure what the Fed was doing as $1.3 trillion of credit that they had to know could not possibly be paid. Uh, why they weren't stopping that occurring. What we do have to do is the securitization. It has to have, there's got to be a certain amount of rules. You've got to have a lot more transparency that we had before. Transparency is a really uh, very important problem. And I think that on the originate to distribute model, that is really at the heart of this housing problem is that in the old days, the bank would make a loan, <coughs> stay with the loan for the 30 years, the bank had every incentive to know that that loan was going to perform, they would only make the loan if they thought it was good. We shifted through securitization to a model where we had mortgage originators uh, originating the loan. They didn't particularly care how the loan performed after they had sold it, and they managed to sell it in a very short period of time. My proposal, would be that we only have properly capitalized institutions originating mortgages and a requirement that they hold a small uh, proportion of uh, the mortgages. I guess I just can't resist uh, making a, one person referred to uh, uh, Rome in the, the, the third century AD. Uh, I think that uh, I, when I go around giving this kind of talk, uh, I can pretty much understand how Jeremiah must have felt, you know, even though his vision was clear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.